The road to what we now call the Principality of Monaco runs along a coast that was settled in the prehistoric epoch by cave dwellers. The area was later occupied by Phoenicians, who built a temple on the spot to Melkart, god of Tyre, and a later temple belonged to the Greek god Heracles, whom the Greeks called Monoecus. The Romans named the region Portulus Hercules Monoeci, which later became Monaco. It was from this port that Julius Caesar set sail on his way back to Rome to fight the rebellious Pompey. Monte Carlo itself and its current emphasis on gambling and high living came about through economic hardships suffered in the 19th century by the then reigning Prince of Monaco, Charles III. His tiny realm was sadly lacking in natural and other resources and Charles got the idea of promoting tourism. He decided he could attract large numbers of people by building a resort in which they could gamble. After a somewhat half-hearted and unprofitable attempt at opening a gambling house, he had the good sense to turn the project over to an expert, Francois Blanc, who proceeded to found the Société des Bains de Mer, the organization which still runs the casinos today. The casino was put up and its success was such that Charles III graciously exempted the city of Monte Carlo from direct taxation. The newly founded city took on the Italianized name of its prince, Monte Carlo. The rest is history. The construction of the casino was begun in 1878. It is actually composed of several structures, the oldest of which is the theater. It was put up between 1878 and 1879. The most recent addition, built in 1910, is remarkable for its painted and sculpted turn-of-the-century decorative scheme. Inside are a number of private and public rooms, each richly decorated and devoted to gambling. While there are other more modern casinos in Monte Carlo, it hardly seems fitting to come here and visit one that can be found in Atlantic City or Las Vegas, when the same entertainment can be found in this turn-of-the-century mall. This, by the way, is the back door of the casino. The casino was designed by Charles Garnier, the architect who designed the Paris Opera House. The exterior of the front of the casino is as elaborate as the theater in the rear, and is decorated with motifs appropriate to casino situations on a cliff overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. The gardens outside the Place du Casino lead directly to the front door of the casino. On one side is the celebrated Hotel de Paris, a Napoleonic-style building, modernized inside but scrupulously maintaining its Belle Epoque character outside. capital of the Côte d'Azur, the Blue Coast, Nice extends along the magnificent Bay des Anges, Bay of the Angels. Because of its wonderful location, it too has been inhabited since ancient times by Phoenicians, Ligurians, Greeks, and Romans. The real heart of Nice is the pedestrian area in the Place Massenet. On one side are gardens and pathways, and on the other the early colonial buildings. Off one side of the square is the Rue Massenet, the center of Nice's nightlife. The Promenade des Anglais, which runs along the beach, was the brainstorm of a certain Reverend Louis Way in 1822. He thought it would be an excellent idea to have this part of the coast leveled off, since he had noticed that his fellow Englishmen, the most common visitors to the area in that time, were especially fond of taking their strolls up and down the strip. The name 
Promenade des Anglais dates from 1844. Naturally, the visitor to Nice must spend some time on the beach. This pebble beach is well covered with chairs and lounges and lined along the street side edge with bars and restaurants. One popular form of recreation is parasailing. By strapping on a light nylon chute and running forward, the chute is filled by the wind and gains some lift. With good timing, the motorboat takes over, adding even more lift, and the flyer is airborne. Landings for the parasailer are simply a matter of slowing down the motorboat. Cannes is probably the most elegant spot on the whole Côte d'Azur. Its magnificent bay, framed by mountains and beaches, and the superb climate of the south of France makes it a truly unique vacation spot. It was not until 1834, however, that the benefits of the area became well known, and it was actually an Englishman again who brought fame and fortune to Cannes. Lord Brougham was traveling to Italy, but was stopped from entering that country because of the cholera epidemic then raging in Provence. He broke his journey at Cannes, and was so enthralled by its charm and climate that he decided to build himself a castle here. He was followed by more Englishmen, and then by others from all over Europe as the fame of the area spread. Across the harbor rises the bell tower of Notre Dame d'Espérance, built between 1521 and 1648. This early cannon, captured at the Battle of Cerisole in 1544, defended the hill town of Saint-Paul-de-Vence. The cannon is built into the town walls, built by Francois I between 1537 and 1547, and still intact. We enter the town through the Port Royal, or Royal Gate, built in the 18th century. This gate soon leads to the main street, with its shops, bakeries, and restaurants. At one end of the main street is this picturesque square which has a fountain built in 1850 and painted by many artists, among them Winston Churchill. While Saint-Paul-de-Vence is a tourist mecca, the residents continue their lives much as they have since the 16th century. Undoubtedly, children played in the streets and ran along the tops of the walls then as they do today. The area which is now the French Riviera, from Nice to Monaco, has been inhabited from prehistoric times. The location of Saint-Paul-de-Vence was particularly valuable to the early tribes because of its easy defense. Following the early inhabitants, Greeks and Romans also inhabited the site. 
the origin of the name of St. Paul is attributed by legend to a visit by Paul the Apostle, who is reputed to have passed through the town. The palace of the popes was built during the Avignon captivity, or the Babylonian captivity as Martin Luther called it. This was the period when the kings of France exerted their influence to have the papacy moved here. Seven popes, all French, reigned at Avignon, and under their papacies the city was fortified with great walls and an immense castle, also fortified, which became the palace of the popes. But in time, the influence of France on the papacy became so great that it became actual interference. This resulted in a clamor for the return to Rome, but it was not until the Council of Constance was held in 1414 that the papacy was finally returned once and for all to Rome. The great audience hall was used by the 13 ecclesiastical judges who held court here. The Magnum Tenellum was the Pope's dining room. The Pope's meals were kept hot in the fireplace and he dined at a table set up along the south wall. Located in the center of the great tower is the Pope's bedchamber, a square room with a corner fireplace and two windows. Through this window, the Pope gave blessings and granted indulgences. A small cathedral sits off to one side of the Palace of the Popes, and in front of the building is Boursin's rendition of Calvary, executed in 1819. A sightseeing train takes visitors around the gardens and grounds of the palace. The Pont saint benizet or the Bridge of saint benizet is the bridge immortalized in the children's song, Sur le Pont d'Avignon. Although Saint Benizet was never canonized, he is thought to have been a young shepherd boy who, obeying a heavenly summons, miraculously lifted a huge rock to form the foundation of the bridge. Whatever its origins, the bridge was begun in 1177 and finished in 1185. It was almost completely demolished after the fall of Avignon in 1226 and then partially rebuilt. In 1680, it was completely abandoned. At the end is a small chapel which once held the remains of Saint Benizet. The relics were lost, however, during the tempestuous years of the French Revolution. <laughs>